I want you to take a couple of seconds right now to picture Jesus. What does he look like? How is he dressed? What is his demeanor? Is he holding anything? Maybe your mind drifts to the different depictions that you've seen Jesus on the walls of family members' homes. Maybe it drifts to the images of Jesus that you've seen in the art world. Whatever it is, I want you to just get a picture of who Jesus is in your mind, visually. Think about his his hair, his face, his eyes, all of it. And while you're doing that, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a bit of an art nerd. I love art. I got to go to the Art Institute of Colorado before I went to seminary, and it's a thing that I am ridiculously passionate about. Um, All forms of art, literally, from one end of the spectrum to the other. And one thing that I really enjoy in art is especially when artists take one subject and each apply their own vision and their own skills and their own talents into that subject. And they see uh, just what different things come out and and different things that they might want to emphasize or different things that they might want to uh, paint over or kind of gloss over. Many times you get an idea of what these artists think about a particular subject. Sometimes you get an idea of what an entire people group or an entire um, country of people think about a particular subject. And if you can even go further in the, the global spectrum, sometimes this art gets shared in the form of an internet meme. And when it gets shared, it goes far and wide, and the comment sections explode, and you get an idea of what many people who have maybe never walked into an art museum get, uh, what the, the idea that they get about a certain subject or a certain piece of art. So I want to share a couple of depictions of a subject near and dear to my heart, Jesus, that have become memes over the last couple of decades. It makes me feel super old to say that. That means we've been around for more than a couple of decades. But I want to share a couple of these. And maybe you'll notice that some of these depictions might resonate with you and that image that you have in your mind. So the first, for some of you, maybe Jesus has this bright, smiling face, long hair, big, ah, oh, like the whitest of teeth. Maybe he has a beard and, and the robes that just flow Maybe he looks like he's going to be your best buddy and he's going to be up for anything that you have to do and he's going to support you in it, man. You do you. He is like your buddy. This Jesus has been around since 1999 from a movie where in that movie, the church decided that the images of Jesus that had been circulating around, the ones painted in the medieval times or the statues, the crucifixes and everything were a little too depressing. So they decided to revamp Jesus, re- rebrand him a little bit with his image and, and turn him into somebody that would attract the young people because he is so much happier and so much brighter. This highlights what we like about Jesus, that he's happy, he's kind, and he is ready to support us in whatever. Maybe this is a picture of Jesus that you got last week when he was at the wedding at Cana, and he said, you know what, these people don't have enough wine, I'm going to give them all the wine they can drink, plus more, and we're going to party. Maybe that is the Jesus that came to your mind. Now, if you grew up going to most churches in the U.S., then you probably have a picture of Jesus that's a little different, but similar, where he has bright blue eyes and a calm, gentle smile, perfectly clean, and seems like he would never raise his voice or even speak above a gentle whisper, how many of you have this Jesus above your, your mantle, in your fireplace? Anybody? No? For those of you who are a little bit more astute, you'll realize that this is not Jesus. This is Obi-Wan Kenobi from the Star Wars prequels. Woo! Space Jesus! <laughs> but what I love about this depiction is that anywhere Jesus is mentioned online, often this picture comes into the comment section. And people put it there. And some people put it there to see if people will notice that this is clearly not Jesus. And um, other times they'll put him there to see if people um, recognize the idea that, well, his hair's right. His eyes are right. His demeanor's right. He's wearing robes. But yet there's just something a little wrong about him when we think of Jesus. Now we're going to go to the other end of the spectrum here. And um, I'm going to share one of my favorite depictions of Jesus. This one's fairly recent. Um, and it's been circulating around, and he's just a little bit different than the others, if you want to put the next one up for me. 
I love this Jesus. This one's called Jacked Jesus. And dude, I have no idea what they were thinking of with this Jesus. I mean, he's powerful. I'll give him that. But I feel like the artist might have taken an anatomy class and just really wanted to show you how much he learned. Like, he's got muscles on muscles. I don't even think some of those are real. Like, this is an image. This just cracks me up. Um, there's not a lot of history on this one. At least I couldn't find a lot of history. So I decided to bring you some gems from the comment section. One, one person commented, his yoke must be easy because he is indeed yoked. Um, and then a couple of them are quotes that they think he might say, such as, dost thou even hoist, brethren? A variant on the, do you even lift, bro? Me. And then my, probably my personal favorite, the one that if you have the ability to put this on a shirt, um, I'm a size double XL, uh, you can totally put this on there. Um, Blessed is the one who skippest not the day of legs. <laughs> Love it. We can't even see his legs, but we know he doesn't skip leg day. He is jacked. All right, I got one more. And this one, um, we're, there's a little bit of history with this. So back in the 1930s, there was this glorious painting done of Jesus called Behold the Man. And it was done in the style of kind of an um, old Italian master fresco oil paint. But as you can see, it had fallen into some disrepair. And unfortunately, as uh, different pieces of it kind of gotten put, uh, like pulled away, you can tell that the varnish is missing, a lot of the, the paint has been peeling and cracked and chipped, um, they wanted to get it restored. So they approached um, an amateur art restorer who stepped up and said, oh yeah, I could totally do that, give it to me, I will restore it, you'll have no idea, it won't even be like it was ever destroyed in the first place, and months went by, and she delivered this. I have no words. <laughs> like, seriously, I've looked at a lot of pieces of art, and I have no idea what she was going for here. Um, on the internet, this has been related to a potato. Um, they call it potato Jesus. They also call it gorilla Jesus. Um, and the artist, when reached for comment, has none. She has no defense of this. I honestly was wondering if this was going to be one of those where she's like, yeah, I totally made him look juvenile to illustrate, blah, blah, blah. You know how artists do. You give them a microphone and they have an opportunity to, to go off. And um, Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Um, anybody who, who has talked to her or has discussed this with her, um, she said that this, this, she stands by her work. This is the best she could do. And uh, as you can see, um, if you were to show this to most people, I don't think they would know it was Jesus. So what these pictures do is they often highlight some aspects of Jesus' character, right? The first one told us that Jesus is kind, he is our friend, and that's true. But it's not the full picture. The second one showed us that Jesus is gentle and he's calm, and he has power. But again, it's not Jesus. The third one shows us how powerful Jesus is, pictures him on the cross and shows us that he is incredibly powerful. But we don't really get the sense that he can do anything or that he has the kind of power that's going to really make any of our lives any different. But then sometimes what these show us is that we'll take a picture of Jesus and we'll paint over it and we'll change it and we'll make it look completely unrecognizable to that anybody who comes up and says, oh, you worship Jesus? Well, that Jesus doesn't look anything like the Jesus I know or the Jesus I've seen here. And in our passage today, we're going to see another group of distortions about Jesus. Now, they may not have physically painted over a picture of him, but you can see that they take things about him and maybe just don't understand it. And these are, depict or dis these are distortions, excuse me, that are very easy for us to fall into as well. So we're going to be in John chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 13. I'll give you a chance to get there. And while you get there, we'll be reminded that this story comes right after Jesus at the wedding at Cana. And while he was there, he celebrated with the people who wanted to celebrate with him. He saved them from lots of shame. He saved them from lots of worry and, and fear. He even set them up 
for future success by giving them things that they could provide for themselves with. They could sell the extra wine that he gave them. And he set them up well. He is there to take care of us and and give us what we need. But in this passage, what we're going to see is an aspect of Jesus that I think a lot of us like to paint over. It's an aspect of Jesus that sometimes we forget about, or it's one that maybe we just don't like as much. So starting in verse 13, we read this. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords and drove them all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and he overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get those out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. Notice how this is a picture of Jesus very different from all of the pictures that we've seen. He's mad. He's angry. He's passionate about something. He's flipping tables over and making a mess. He's causing a scene. He's filled with passion. So you might be wondering, with all the other depictions of Jesus that we have, what happened here? Why was Jesus so angry here? Let's set the scene. Every year, devout Jews and non-believing Jews would travel from wherever they were, and they would come to Jerusalem in order to offer sacrifices on the days of Passover. Now, Passover, for those of you who may not be familiar, was the story told all the way back in Exodus of when the Jews were slaves in Egypt. And God sent plagues to, how shall we say, encourage Pharaoh to let the people go. Those plagues ranged everything from kind of annoying things to much more dangerous and and destructive things. Finally, the last plague was going to be the death of every firstborn son. Now, in order for God's people to protect themselves in this time, God provided a way for them to do that. They would have to take a lamb, sacrifice it, and then put its blood on their doorposts. And then the angel of death, who was going through to claim the firstborn son of, every, um, is, of everyone who didn't have this symbol, would pass over their house. Hence, we get the name. And obviously, because of this plague, the um, Jewish people were allowed to be free Um, Pharaoh kind of had to change a heart again, went after them, read it in Exodus. It's a great story. But um, because of this, it's become a time of celebration. It shows how powerful God is, how much he cares about his people, and how much he desires to free them and, and be their God. So what would happen is that everybody would travel because there was one temple in one centralized location in Jerusalem. Everybody who was um, a believer would have to travel to that area. So why did Jesus get this angry? Now, some people have wondered if it's because they were selling things on a sacred space, which has led some to say that you shouldn't sell anything in church, you shouldn't have any kind of money exchanging hands in church, everything should just be um, giving-based, which um, is not true, because traveling with animals is difficult. I don't know how many of you have tried to lead um, even the most stubborn dog a place it doesn't want to go. It's going to fight you. Now ramp that up by a few thousand pounds and you have a bull that is definitely not going to want to go with you 50 or 100 miles to go be sacrificed, even if it doesn't know what's going to happen. So what they said way back in Deuteronomy, after the exodus had happened and God was establishing his covenant and the rules for his people to live, he said, you know, if somebody is far away, it is okay for them to bring money with them to the temple. They can then buy what they need to sacrifice and that is totally fine. Because money is a lot easier to travel with. Money is not going to fight you near as hard as some of the animals did. And uh, the uh, money's not going to die along the way and then force you to figure out what you're going to do then anyway. So that was not the issue. So what was it? And I think the issue we see here is our first distortion. It's taking something that God set up and painting over it to serve ourselves rather than serve God. See, knowing that a large influx of people were going to be traveling into Jerusalem's temple, the religious leaders of the day decided that they uh, didn't need to continue charging what they had been charging. They decided to jack their prices up, which never happens today, right? Those of you who go to concerts and there's only like five, ten tickets left, like you pay the same for those tickets that you'd pay for any other concert, right? I mean, is that how it works? I know it's been a while since I've been to a concert, but... um, 
Or if you go to that concert, you recognize that everything's just going to be more expensive, right? That water that you could buy at the grocery store for a dollar is now going to be five or ten dollars. Same thing was happening here, but what sets it up a little bit differently is that it wasn't just merchants who were setting these prices. And it wasn't just inflation that was causing the issues. It was the religious leaders who saw an opportunity to make a little bit of extra money. They knew they'd have a captive audience, so they decided to skyrocket the prices, knowing that being religious leaders in their robes and finery, that everybody would trust them and would pay whatever they asked them to pay. Now, what's interesting even more is that this wasn't just a group of people selling things. The religious leaders were also the people who could determine whether or not your sacrifice was acceptable to to actually be sacrificed. So if you spent all this time bringing your animals with you and you were ready to sacrifice and you present it in front of them, pretty sure you know what's going to happen when the people who control how much you have to pay for a new one see you with your old one. They're going to be like, ah, sorry, dude. Hair's out of place. You're going to need to buy a new one. Uh, Do you, you see how it walked there? That fourth step was just a little bit shorter than the other steps. Doesn't count. You have to buy a new one. And in order to buy a new one, you couldn't just go over and hand your silver or your gold to uh, the merchants. You had to exchange your money to a type of money that was being used at the time. And surprise, surprise, there was a hefty fee to do that as well. So what we see is that these people have been taking an opportunity to make themselves wealthy by using things that God had set up to be about sacrifice and to be about him. Now notice something even even more interesting. Jesus calls out a very specific group of people. Notice how Jesus turns over the, the money changers' tables, he gets the sheep and cattle out of there, but then looks over to a group of people and says, you guys with doves, get them out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a market. Why? Why doves? You see, doves were not the sacrifice of the wealthy. You see, doves were plentiful. They were easy to find. They were fairly easy to transport. They were pretty easy to to raise, even though you didn't really need to raise them. You could just go find however many birds you needed to, and you could make your sacrifice. God set this up early on that said, if you you don't have cattle, if you don't have sheep, you can sacrifice a dove. These were for the poor. The doves were sacrificed by widows. Widows. The doves were sacrificed by those who had nothing else. You see, doves would be sacrificed by a betrothed couple who, out of wedlock, were expecting their firstborn son and had been shunned by their family so that when it came time to dedicate that son, all they had were doves. That's right. Mary and Joseph, when they dedicated Jesus at the temple, didn't sacrifice sheep or cattle. They sacrificed doves. So you can see why this hits just a little bit harder for Jesus. It hits just a little closer to home because he knows what it's like to be poor. He knows what it's like for his family to come and to have to sacrifice. And these people have been taking advantage of people who are like his family, were like him when he grew up, and doing it in a way that obviously warranted a reaction. I think just about any one of us would have been angry as well, right? This is such a dangerous distortion Because it looks right. It's such a dangerous distortion because it looks religious. It looks close. They did a much better job of painting over and hiding their intentions than our art restorer friend did of trying to emulate Jesus. You see, those uh, in Deuteronomy, it says you can charge for cattle. You can charge for these things, but it never never said exactly how much. You see, the religious leaders would have been trusted people, so people would come up and wouldn't bat an eye at spending whatever they told them to because why would a religious leader lie to us? They didn't know any different because it was also the only temple. So people coming in wouldn't be able to compare it to anything else. They would simply have to do what happened. And you see, what happened is that the religious leaders distorted what God had set up originally in order to serve themselves and become wealthy. Jesus took offense to this. And he scattered everything, and we'll see even more reasons as we read on. But this leads us into our second distortion. 
Something that I think is a little easier for us to fall into, which is failing to see the whole picture of Jesus. We're going to be in verse 18 of John 2. It says this, The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken us 46 years to build this temple. And you're going to raise it again in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. So we get an interesting sign here. So obviously the the money changers and the, the religious leaders are a little upset that Jesus ran in here, he flipped their tables, and he caused a mess. And I imagine some of the ones that were maybe a little bit closer to God were feeling a little bit of guilt and were like, man, you know what? You're right. We needed to be told what we were doing was wrong. You're right. I'm going to clean up my stuff. I'm going to go home. I'm going to figure it out. But the more vocal of the religious leaders start questioning Jesus. They're like, all right, I don't care if you're speaking truth. I don't care if you're hitting on something that we know we probably shouldn't be doing. But like, what gives you the right, dude? Like, perform a sign, perform a miracle, and we'll believe you. Whatever you do, you do that, and we'll get out. We'll be fine. Now, Jesus understands that these are people who are religious leaders. They should know him. They should be aware of who Jesus is. They should be aware of who the Messiah is. They should be aware of how prophets act. Let alone, they should be aware that they shouldn't be extorting money from the people who come to them for religious services. And now, I don't think that it matters to them that Jesus is surrounded by all of his followers at this point or he's done other signs and wonders. They need another one. It's always, how, how, what have you done for me now? Prove to me that you are good by making it rain, you know, or whatever it is, testing him. And I don't know, I don't know if it's maybe because my image of Jesus is a little bit more like that jacked Jesus picture that I showed you, but I think if, he, if the religious leaders, if he would have said, tear this temple down, I'll rebuild it. If they would have taken their hammers and they would have gone, okay, he said he's going to do it, and they tore it down, I think he would have rebuilt it. He's God. He, like, he totally could have done it. I think he was testing them to see what are they truly putting their hope and their trust in. Because if they would have known what the scriptures had said, that zeal for your house would consume me, and knowing that that was being written about the future Messiah, they might be thinking, okay, maybe this, there's something different to this Jesus. Maybe there's something to him, and whatever he says, I'm going to do. And I wonder if, we don't see this in the text, but I wonder if a religious leader would have picked up a hammer and started going back, and Jesus may have commended them and said, let me tell you something. Follow me, and I'm going to share with you a whole range of things that this means. But we don't see that. We see that Jesus was, in a sense, yes, talking about his body, and we get this wonderful aside from John. I love this. We are so privileged to have this book of John written so many years after these accounts for him to come back in and be like, dude, we didn't know what he was saying here either. Um, But later, it all made sense to us, and I'm not going to make you wait until we get to the end of this book and Jesus raises from the dead. I'm going to tell you now that when he dies and he comes back, um, this whole thing made sense. We knew he was talking about him, his temple, his body. And now Jesus is known as the temple in many parts of scripture, so this isn't surprising to us. But he, what he's doing is he's saying, you need to tear down the things that are keeping you from me, even if they look like me. You need to tear down the things that are serving you rather than serving me. And you see, Jesus came not to destroy the physical temple. He came to destroy all of our versions of the temple. He didn't come to destroy the rulers of this world. He came to destroy how much we rely on them and not on him. You see, Jesus never does anything without several layers of meaning. He was talking about tearing down the entire sacrificial system because all of it was going to be fulfilled in him. It was all designed to point to him, be fulfilled in him. So you see, sometimes we get so caught up in our buildings and things that we do for God that we miss out on who, who God truly is. It's like that picture of Obi-Wan that I showed you. It looks right, has the right col- hair color, right hair, eye, like eyes and beard and all that stuff, but it's still not him. The closer you get, the more you see That's not Jesus. So finally, we're going to look at one more distortion. And this is where we take Jesus and we make him look the way we want. Starting in verse 23, chapter 2, it says this, Now while he was in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, many people saw the signs he was performing and believed in his name. 
But Jesus would not entrust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. So now not much is said specifically about what's in each person here. What, what is meant by him knowing it? Maybe he knew they were all sinners, which, surprise, surprise, we all are. He knows that. But I think it goes a little bit more than that. I think it touches on the distortion that we saw earlier where people had this false idea of who the Messiah was going to be. See, all through scripture we see in, in, early on um, in history, literature, and in every book of scripture, we see people trying to take Jesus and make him something he never was intended to be. They try to make him something that seemed great, seemed huge, seemed big, but it's not even close to what Jesus actually should be. We see people saying that, oh, this dude, he's powerful, he performs signs and miracles, he has authority, he takes care of the poor, he's going up against corrupt systems, maybe we should make him king. And you would see what they would do is they would establish, you know, they would treat him as a king. We're going to see this in a few weeks when we talk about Palm Sunday. They would treat him as he were a king coming in to conquer Rome and establish his kingdom. But you see, Jesus is like, you're missing the point. That's not what I'm here for. I'm not here to tear down one kingdom and establish a new one. I'm here to bring a kingdom that transcends geographical locations. I'm here to establish a kingdom in the hearts of every single person who believes in me. I'm here to set up a kingdom that has nothing to do with race or creed or how you grew up or the, the money you have or whatever it is. I have a kingdom that is going to be based on whether or not you believe that I am who I say I am and whether or not you are willing to follow me and embrace the Lord of the universe. That's it. And yes, he would conquer corrupt systems, but by handling corruption. You see, he would handle sinful people by taking care of sin. And yes, he would take care of Israel's enemies by taking care of all of our enemies, the enemy. You see, we try to take Jesus and squeeze him into this little teeny tiny box when he is so much bigger and greater and more amazing than we could ever imagine. And he's beyond even the most outlandish things we think he's going to do. So what do we do with all this? Jesus has given us this story for a reason. John has written it down for a reason. And I think it gives us three questions to, decide, to, to discuss with ourselves, discuss with one another, to think about. These are questions that I think about myself, um, and I'm just offering them to you as well. Question one is this. What are you truly passionate about? Have you ever been zealous? Has there, any been, has there been something for you that angers you the way Jesus was angered here? Do you see things that are going on in our world right now that make you think someone should stand up for this and that someone is going to be me? Or do you see it and you get mad and you think somebody should be somebody else? That somebody should be anybody but me? Are you fired up for the things that God has fired up for? Are you, does your heart break for the things that God's heart breaks for? And I tell you what, just look around. You will find things. Just be open to them. Be open to what the Lord has. And yours might not be the same as somebody else's. That's fine. The Lord has created us all differently. Some of us have a heart for homelessness. Some of us have a heart to see the poor not be exploited or extorted. Some of us see a, have a heart for the unborn, have a heart for the trafficked. Whatever it looks like, the Lord has given us the same passion that he has given Jesus to go after the things that make him angry. So what is that for you? There's so many things in this world that need us to step up and fight. What is it? Question two. What is Jesus calling you to tear down? Maybe the reason we're unable to see those things that God is angry about is because we're too busy looking at all of the other things that distract us from his mission. Maybe we're excited about the wrong things. Maybe we have built too many things on the wrong things and we think that church <clears throat> should look a certain way. Maybe we think that um, being a Christian shouldn't extend into certain areas of our lives. Maybe we have built up a Jesus 
that isn't Jesus at all. Maybe we have a savior that we think is going to save us and it's not Jesus, it's something else. And we've built everything we can on that thing, whether it's our status, our power, our money, our relationships, whatever it is. What is God calling you to tear down so that you can see what he has for you? And what would he rebuild upon that storm foundation? Because I guarantee everything that I have ever given to Jesus to tear down, he has repaid so much better. He has refocused me on things that are so much more important than the things I used to spend my time on. And I promise you, it might feel hard. It might feel difficult for you to say, all right, I'm going to take this thing that I've been holding on to for a super long time and I'm going to give it to you. I promise if you give it to Jesus, he is going to rebuild something better. And now finally, our third question. What distortions of Jesus do you have? Theologian A.W. Tozer once said that what you think about God is the most important thing about you. So who is Jesus to you? Is he just your buddy and your best friend? Ready to support you in everything and be like, yeah, woo, you do you, dude. But never correcting you, never pointing out the things in you that are hindering you from relationship with God or hindering you from sharing this relationship with other people. You see that always clean, pure, never going to get his hands dirty, calm, gentle, floats everywhere, never going to raise his voice, never going to get upset about the evils in this world and just be like, life is great. You see, powerful, but not kind. Is he yoked, able to carry everything, but unwilling to do so? Or have we painted over the true Jesus so much in our minds that he is no longer recognizable if somebody were to ask us who we serve? Does he look like a gorilla or a potato? My hope is that even if your picture of Jesus is distorted beyond even everything that I've shown you this morning, that you know that in the words of Scripture, especially here in the book of John, God gives us the true picture of Jesus. It's aspects that we see in every story, in every miracle, in every account of Jesus, all taken together to show us the multifaceted, amazing Savior. And as we continue to go through the book of John, the closer we get to Jesus, my hope is that all of us will erase the distortions we have of him. So now another symbol that we have been given is in the form of communion. Those of you who haven't had a chance to grab your elements, please uh, go get some now. There's some at each of the doors here. There were some as you came in. You can't have this one. This one's mine. In this, God has given us a symbol. He says, this bread symbolizes his body that was real, tangible. He existed. He was a human on this earth. He wasn't just some philosophical construct. He was real. He got dirty. He got mad. He did things that no one else could do. And it was that body that was also broken, who shed blood, because that's what was needed to repair the relationship between us and God. So he says, in this, you see the full picture. You see who Jesus is, who he was, and who he always will be. Picture of an everlasting covenant that he made with us. So as you take some time to prepare your hearts for communion, I encourage you to just contemplate the body and blood of our Lord and pray that he would reveal any ways that you might have distorted his message or distorted his image and my hope is that it will become even clearer for you. Amen.